The Art of Reading, Lecture 3, Hearing Voices, Illusion and Echo. So much of reading literature is what I call hearing voices. We are working our way through a text when suddenly some static registers on our mind's antenna. We hear something familiar, uncanny even, in the Freudian sense of the word. Strange, but in an intimate way, as if we've known this element somewhere before. And then the flash of recognition hits home. We have, in fact, heard this before. The author has made an allusion to another literary text, and we have been able to identify it. But things are often not this simple, and in some cases, allusion is simply too weak a term to account for the importance of the reference to this other work that arrested our attention. Indeed, sometimes the illusion carries such weight as to lay bare a major, if not the major, concern and intent of this later text. Whatever the case, it is an abiding function of great literary works to include a dialogue with the voices of the past, even as they forge their own originality. And it is therefore a challenge to the reader to be able to discern these often well-hidden, deeply submerged voices that are being referenced. For all these reasons, I am going to devote this lecture to what I call the reader's necessity of hearing voices. I will approach this matter by focusing on an example from my own life as a reader, one involving Dante, that brings this issue of voice in the oral A-U-R-A-L, as in of a relating to the ear, forcefully home. Before I do so, however, I should first talk briefly about two technical terms from the world of reading and writing. These terms are illusion and echo. Let's start with illusion. Perhaps more than any other figure of speech or rhetorical practice, Illusion represents a perennial controversy in the history of literature and aesthetics. The inclusion of a predecessor verse, metaphor, theme, or image by a later poet, for example, has been central to debates over imitation versus originality, naive versus sentimental poetry, romanticism versus neoclassicism, and more recently, modernity versus postmodernity. For the Renaissance, or neoclassical poet, Sustained composition was unthinkable without an overt flexing of one's allusive skill. For the romantic poet, on the other hand, the trick was to make an illusion without appearing to do so, to sublimate the source text into non-existence and thereupon establish one's own fictitious originality, if not priority. For the postmodernist, illusion itself has become somewhat quaint and anachronistically literary practice, updated to the more ironic strategies of citation like pastiche, palimpsest, or even the erstwhile Pierre Maynard of Borges with his verbatim translation of, the, of Don Quixote comes to mind. Exact replication. This Borges story that I'm referring to is when Borges writes about a writer who copies the Quixote, exactly as it was centuries later. And Borges very ironically describes this as a radical translation that preserves the inherent antiquity and opacity of the original source. So that's just kind of an example of an extreme form of illusion to basically reproduce a text. Now, the work of reading is to a large extent the capacity to register illusion. Let me emphasize this. When you start to read seriously, when you start to read extensively, you start to build up a repertoire, an archive, as it were, of works that you know. And then you'll read a book and there'll be a kind of gesture toward or inclusion of one of these other works. And it will give your own sense of this new work that you're reading, a real sense of its literary texture. It, it really adds to the appreciation of reading and to an understanding of a literary work. So. Illusion is key to the reader. To detect illusions is key. It reveals the literary principles of a work, it gives you its influences, and it suggests or even states its themes. Illusions appear to us in many shapes and sizes, some obvious and some obscure. Often they appear indirectly. This is where things get a little more tricky and interesting. Mediated through language, 
or even theme. In some cases, they are what may be termed echoes of an original source, an echo. John Hollander describes the situation like this. Echo is a way of alluding that is inherently poetic rather than expository and makes new metaphor rather than learned gestures. Poets seem to echo earlier voices with full or suppressed consciousnesses that and of how they are so doing, by accident or by plan, but with the same shaping spirit that gives form to tropes of thought and feeling. Whether these figurative echoes constitute a kind of underground cipher message for the attentive poetic ear, or perhaps a private melody or undersong hummed during composition by the poet as a spell or charm, matters less than that the revisionary power of elusive echo generates new figuration. Now, I've talked about what's about to follow elsewhere in an essay called Echoes of Andromache and Inferno 10 that I published in Dante Studies, and I'd like to revisit that essay for this, this lecture on hearing echoes. Hollander's notion of echo as an ambiguous form of illusion that at once gestures in the direction of a source yet at the same time establishes its freedom from that origin by generating new figuration perfectly encapsulates what occurs in Dante's reworking of an episode from Virgil's epic poem The Aeneid and Dante's own epic, The Inferno, part of his Divine Comedy, which was written 1307 to 1319. Now, Inferno 10 is one of the most justly celebrated in all of Dante, and to my mind, it represents a summit in the history of Western literature, one of its peaks. Inferno 10 is the place where, and I'm quoting now from the Hollander translation, those who hold the soul dies with the body. This is where heresy is punished. Those who believe that when our body dies, our soul dies with it. Here we find the Epicureans who are punished for the sin of heresy. Now, this is strange, for heresy was one of the most important and dangerous sins in the eyes of the Christian church during Dante's time, because it offered competing doctrines that challenged the very authority of the same church. Yet Dante here punishes a pagan doctrine, Epicureanism, with little or no space dedicated to the rivals of his own Christian faith. But Dante was right about one thing. Heretics were often renowned for their great intellectual prowess. And in Inferno 10, Dante's choice brings us directly and indirectly to two of the finest and most intriguing minds of his age, Farinata degli Uberti and Dante's primo amico, or best friend, Guido Cavalcanti. Let's keep these names in mind, especially Guido Cavalcanti. But as we see, it's not Guido Cavalcanti Dante meets in hell. It's his father, whose, whose name is Cavalcante de Cavalcanti. We'll call him uh, Cavalcante Sr. When Dante arrives in Inferno 10, it's the strangest of homecomings. The two sinners he meets, Farinata and Cavalcante, were patriarchs of Dante's hometown, Florence, the place that would exile Dante for good in 1301, and in so doing, break his spirit at least temporarily. Dante is writing the poem in 1307. Let's keep that in mind. The Divine Comedy takes place in 1300, so Dante's not quite exiled yet. That will happen in 1301. But he's writing in 1307, so he knows, even though his character in the poem doesn't, that he's going to be exiled. It is, in fact, in this canto, Inferno 10, that Dante deals with exile with the bitterness of exile for the first time because Farinata, a general of the opposing political party to Dante's, will predict it. So what happens in this canto and how does it relate to the, this lecture on hearing voices? Let me go into that now. When Dante was a young man, he wrote a book called The New Life, La Vita Nuova, around 1295, and he dedicated the book to his first friend, his primo amico, Guido Cavalcanti. That's Cavalcanti's son. Guido was an extremely wealthy, dashing, and fascinating figure in medieval Florence, and Dante revered him. Dante looked up to him as a kind of older, poetic brother of sorts. He was a mentor to Dante. 
And he nurtured Dante's poetic growth in a movement called the Sweet New Style, the Dolce Stil Novo. Several years later in 1300, in his capacity of one of Florence's six priors, highest elected official in the city, Dante actually signed an edict banishing the radical Cavalcante from the city. So let's think about that. Cavalcanti was his best friend, Guido Cavalcanti. And then just about five years later, Cavalcanti was more of a political radical within Dante's own party, no less. Runs afoul of the law, and Dante signs an edict sending him into exile. Cavalcanti was recalled from exile, but too late. He contracted malaria and died later that same year in 1300. When Dante began the Commedia in 1307, he handled his role in his best friend's demise with breathtaking defensiveness. As I said, in the fictional world of the Divine Comedy, 1300, Guido is still alive, because the poem takes place during Easter, 1300, and Guido dies later that year. And Dante encounters Guido's Epicurean father, Cavalcante. Incidentally enough, Epicureanism was also a sin associated with Guido. So it's kind of a stand-in. The father's kind of a stand-in for a son here, if you can follow that. I know it's a little complicated, but once you start to unravel the puzzle, the significance of this scene really hits home. Dante sees Guido Cavalcanti's father, Cavalcante, and he asks, Cavalcante asks, Where is my son, and why is he not with you? If you go through this prison because you're such a genius, if you get to take this trip through hell, the father asked Dante, then why isn't my Guido with you? He was just as brilliant. Dante says that your son, quote, perhaps held in scorn, end quote, Dante's guide through hell. And to reference his guide in hell, Dante uses a pronoun, cui, which it means whom, basically, And it's really difficult to say whether that whom refers to Virgil, Dante's pagan god, Beatrice, Dante's muse, or God himself. So we know that Guido is scorning someone, but we're not sure whom. But the father here is held in scorn. And he hears that past tense verb, and he assumes that his son, like the verb, is past tense. And this is where it's fascinating, and I'll remember reading this, and And it was one of those moments in my reader life where my hair stood on end a little bit. The father says, does not the sweet light strike upon my son's eyes? Does not the sweet light strike upon my son's eyes? Wow, that's a line that does a lot of things. First of all, sweet references the sweet new style, that poetic movement that that nurtured Dante in his relationship with Guido Cavalcanti. It's also written in the style of the Sweet New Style. You know, it has a kind of very melodious, refined, lyrical inflection. And then it's an allusion to another work. It's an allusion to another work. Dante pauses before answering his friend's best friend's father. And he's basically telling them Guido's not dead in the fiction of the Divine Comedy, though he is dead in real life, right? When Dante pauses, the father of his best friend falls into the broth of hell and shows himself no more. Dante never referred to Guido Cavalcante's death again. I believe that Inferno 10 is really the guiltiest of cantos, in more ways than one. The source of Dante's anxiety comes to us through an allusion in Inferno 10 to one of the most celebrated scenes in the Aeneid, Virgil's epic about the Roman Empire, written in 19 BCE. The episode I'm referring to is the Little Troy episode, the Parwa Troia in Latin. Let's see how this happens. Now, I said to you when I read that line all those years ago, why is my son not with you? Does not the sweet light strike upon his eyes? Let me read to you the Italian. Non fiere li occhi suoi lo dolce lumen. Does not the sweet light strike upon his eyes? 
I had heard that line before. I knew it. I was hearing voices, if you will. I was getting an illusion, and I knew this wasn't just a mere flexing of Dante's readerly prowess, that this illusion has a lot to it. It carries a lot of weight. The line re- nearly jumped off the page. I'd heard it before. I could just feel it, but wasn't sure where. And then my mind went back to the Aeneid. Dante's beloved text. Remember, Virgil is Dante's guide through Inferno and Purgatory. And a memorable scene that features in the Aeneid, what I will call the Trojan version of Disneyland. With the flames of his lost city only recently left behind, Virgil's protagonist, the epic hero Aeneas, recounts to Dido, his queen for whom he'll fall in love and have this tragic love affair with, recounts to Dido how he left the burnt plains of Troy in tears and as an exile in search of a new homeland. After false starts, Aeneas is reminded by the Panates, the household gods he had rescued from Troy, of his true destination. I'm quoting now from West's prose translation of the Aeneid, quote, a region for which the Greeks used the name Hesperia, an ancient land with might in her arms and in her fertile soil. This Italy is our true home. Fortified with this promise, the Trojans set sail in search of a second Troy in what today is the Italian peninsula. Then things get very interesting. Blown off course, the ships detour into Buthrodum, where Aeneas hears, quote, a tale almost beyond belief, a story whose mix of the familiar and the unimaginable Freud would later describe in terms of the uncanny. Buthrodum, it turns out, is a Greek city under the rule of Priam's son Helenus, who has taken Andromache, Andromache, the former wife of the great warrior Hector, slain by Achilles in the Iliad, as his queen. Aeneas encounters Andromache performing a ritual sacrifice to the ghost of Hector. He is overcome by the prospect of her wild tears and, one imagines, symptoms of a word which would not be invented till many centuries later, nostalgia. The land Aeneas has stumbled upon is a copy of his lost home, peopled by old friends. So you understand what's happened. Aeneas is blown off course and he lands in this basically a city that's a replica of Troy. Can you imagine what he felt after all that wandering, after seeing Troy burnt to the ground by the Greeks because of the horse? He finds us as essentially a little replica, as I said, a kind of Trojan Disneyland. The land he has stumbled upon is a copy of his lost home, peopled by old friends, with, quote, a citadel built to resemble the old city, unquote, of Troy, and a river named after the Trojan Xanthus. But Aeneas's nostalgia gives way to pity, for a funereal atmosphere pervades the city, to which Aeneas refers to with the pejorative tag, Parwa Troia, Little Troy. In her unstinting grief and obsession with the past, Andromache seems more dead than alive, and the Xanthus River itself is described as dry, Arens. Virgil refashions the Trojan polis into a necropolis, a city of the dead that Aeneas will leave. He cannot return home, he learns in Aeneid three, because home no longer exists. He will perforce continue to wander and seek not a second Troy but a new Rome, which for all its glories and regenerative force will always remind him of a former life lost. Okay, the story I've narrated so far is a familiar one. But where does Dante, and by extension Cavalcante, father and son, fit into all this? Well, let's focus on what Andromache says when she encounters Aeneas. I've given you the kind of story. Let's go back to that initial encounter. The wife of the great Trojan hero Hector, taken in captivity, forced to live in this kind of Parwa Troia, this little Troy, obsessed with the past, performing funeral rites. Andromache says to Aeneas, she asks him, and I'll give you the Latin first, aut si lux amare cacet, which we can translate basically as she essentially asks him, are you living? And then she says, when she says, out si lux ama recaset, she's asking him, or if the sweet light has fled, right? 
Um, and then she says, if the sweet light is fled, where is Hector? Now, where have we heard those lines before? We heard it in Inferno 10. Now, why would Dante put in Italian the same words from the Latin of the Trojan Queen Andromache? What does that do? What is that illusion? Better, what is that echo? Because it's a different language. You see how it's kind of the way an echo is a refraction, an oral refraction? What's going on here? As I said, this is exactly what Cavalcante de Cavalcanti as of Dante. Non fiere li occhi suoi lo dolce lumen. Does not the sweet light strike upon Guido's eyes? Extraordinary. Dante quotes Virgil, translates his Latin into Italian, and translates the story of an imperial quest into a Christian's pilgrim's journey through hell to confront the ghost of his best friend's father, and by extension the ghost of his best friend himself. Through this echo or illusion, Dante channels all his ambivalence and guilt, I believe, regarding this one-time best friend into a literary sequence that challenges the reader to detect the trace of the Virgilian subtext in and through figures that are themselves ghost-like, first the mournful Andromache in Aeneid III, and then Cavalcante Sr. in Inferno X. You see this echo effect, this kind of, this literary resonance in and through poetic sound, in and through the registering in the reader's ear and mind of this illusion. This Virgilian scene has proved remarkably resurgent in writers ranging from Dante and Yeats to the French authors Racine, Baudelaire, Mallarmé, and even more recently Jacques Roubault. The great Renaissance scholar Thomas Green even proclaimed Virgil's creation of the Little Troy episode and its stubborn resonance in the Aeneid as embodying what Green called the quintessential tragic anachronism of Western literary history. Let me quote from Green to you. He writes, The Aeneid displays an awareness of tragic anachronism that Virgil's culture did not formulate discursively. And as the central classic of Western civilization, it inscribed this awareness, this ambivalent sympathy upon our whole tradition. It authorized the regret that stems from turning one's back as the poem as a whole turns its back. Andromache is a sign for the dominance of that Homeric past from which Roman epic struggles to free itself, but not without misgivings, and these misgivings have remained to define our intercourse with our past. That's the end of the green quote. I like that. It's very powerful. It authorizes the regret that stems from turning one's back as the poem, the Aeneid as a whole, turns its back. In short, the voice of Andromache surfaces above the din of epics' historical struggles to remind each successive generation of readers that, in this literary genre, as in life, there are winners and there are losers. In order to advance the claims of the Aeneid, Virgil pointedly circumscribes the voice of Andromache and, by extension, the architectural echoes. We not only have oral echoes here, but we have architectural echoes because the, the city of Buthrodum looks like Troy, right? It's a kind of visual refraction of it. In a remote outpost whose gravitational melancholy Aeneas will abandon. The resilient voice of Andromache and her failed replication of Troy thus appear as a ghostly trace in a Virgilian master narrative about epic building that is suppressed yet never wholly eliminated or even satisfactorily absorbed. <laughs> 